58, by the way. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County and our webinar today, Bitcoin Beyond the Hype, Why Cryptocurrencies and Blockchains Matter. Uh, it's a topic that we hear about all the time and are very confused about, myself included. I'm Steve Smith, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE in Fairfield County. I'll be your host. Our presenter is going to be Matt Krieger. I'll give you a little bit more on that in uh, in just a minute. One other thing I'll mention right up front here is that Matt and this topic, more or less this topic, maybe in a little bit more depth because there's more time, is going to be available in a workshop that's live format uh, in Darien at the Darien Library on next Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. So you can just make a note of that. And, and um, actually, some of your questions, if you could actually go to both of them, you could uh, maybe even get more information from Matt. Uh, so uh, as usual, first let me tell you a little bit about SCORE. Many of you uh, know this well, but I'm, I'll, I'll go through it fairly quickly. But SCORE is a national organization. We're a part of the Small Business Administration of the U.S. government and have been since the mid-'60s. Um, there are about 320 offices around the United States with over 11,000 volunteers, uh, accent on volunteers. We're uh, all volunteers. And uh, in Fairfield County, uh, which is basically Greenwich up through Bridgeport um, and uh, not including Danbury south of there, we have 130 volunteers with various degrees of industry process and subject matter expertise that are available to help you in one-on-one -on -one counseling and, and mentoring uh, sessions and more about that in just a second but we also uh, offer workshops and webinars webinar you're on one um, as an educate as education programs uh, out of this office so basically when you think about us at SCORE Think about one-on-one -on -one counseling, think about workshops, think about webinars, and our website, which is fairfieldcounty.score.org, fairfieldcounty.score.org, where there's a, an, an immense amount of uh, resources and tools and answers to frequently asked questions by small businesses. Um, and you can actually also access up to 15 months of past webinars uh, which would be about 30-plus webinars uh, through that website as well. Uh, it's also interesting to note that about almost 20% of our webinar attendees eventually sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling. So if you've been thinking about doing that, now is a good time to, uh, to make the leap. Do, go to the website, and you'll see, um, see it right there, sign, uh, contact a, a counselor. Um, our next webinar, per usual, will be in two weeks, April 16th, 
and the subject is how to do a lean canvas for businesses and nonprofit organizations. What is a lean canvas, you might ask? Well, it's a way to test the viability of your business idea or nonprofit mission plan before you go all in on it. And uh, our speaker will be Bill Schloth. Uh, Bill is also a SCORE member. You've already gotten one email about this uh, webinar, and you'll be getting uh, two more, last one, uh, the day of the event. Uh, also, special reminder, our very popular workshop series, not webinar, workshop series, Simple Steps, is running starting on April 9th, also Tuesday, at the Fairfield Library. So uh, see our website for details. This is a five-step event where you can get everything you need to know and more about um, starting uh, a business. Um, we run them periodically through the year and very, very popular. Okay, today's event. We're going to stop at 1 o'clock. That's fact number one. Fact number two, and I always get this question, so I'll say it twice. The webinar is being recorded and will be available by the end of the day through the website archives or on-demand. It's actually called on the website on-demand webinars. So they're, it's being recorded. It will be available by the end of the day through the on-demand click uh, at the website fairfieldcounty.score.org. Q&A. Uh, we've set aside time, uh, about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. As you've uh, probably done this before, uh, there's a chat window in the lower left. Uh, put your questions down there. I will moderate them, and which usually means at the end we'll do them in 10 minutes. But if there's a question that really needs to be answered right away, I'll raise my hand and try to interrupt Matt politely and have him answer the question then. Uh, at, I'm almost finished. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll be receiving an email asking you to evaluate the quality of the webinar. I personally look at all of these. They're very, very important. Um, is a way to feed back to the speaker and to improve the quality and value of our webinar program. Now, on to the speaker. Matt Krieger is a technologist and executive with experience in IT and manufacturing. He has a long history. Um, he's currently advisor, chief technology officer, or has been for nonprofits, and is currently VP of technology at Cobra Incorporated. Previously, Matt has held senior IT leadership positions at Time, Inc., and Reader's Digest. Matt serves on the board of several, two actually, nonprofits and is a frequent presenter on topics of business and technology. And last but not least, I'm sure he would admit he's a mentor here at Score Fairfield County. He's also creator of a text-to-speech service called Whisper, which is whisper.io. He may... Uh, W H Y S P E R dot I O. So, Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, as I said, we'll we'll uh, take 10 minutes at the end for uh, Q and A. So, Matt, please go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, let me briefly talk about what we're going to cover and and what we're not going to cover. So, what's going to be covered today are some of the uh, uh, technological, financial, and, and social impacts of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. It's going to help you understand what they are, why they may or may not be important, let you make that decision for yourself, and help you understand some of the hows and whys. What today is not, it is not a discussion of uh, a Bitcoin as an investment vehicle, although I do touch on that. It is not an investment decision. I'm not an investment advisor. Uh, and, and I don't purport to, to give any advice on that topic. So let me hop right in to, uh, to Bitcoin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some of the technological underpinnings of Bitcoin, and then we're going to segue that into, into Bitcoin itself. So <clears throat> starting from here, so the, the technological, the primary technological uh, underpinning of Bitcoin is what's known as a blockchain. You may have heard that in the news. Fundamentally, a blockchain is nothing more than a technological means of tracking and transferring and storing information about assets, valuable assets. In general, they could be digital assets, but think about money, think about intellectual property, 
think about things like that. So a blockchain is a piece of technology that fundamentally is about tracking and managing the ownership of those assets. What the blockchain aims to do in a very fundamental way is something that today we have banks and financial institutions do for us, which is to prevent somebody from double spending the same money. That is, if you think about it, a, a fundamental problem uh, that, that underlines the payment system that is the reason we have a trusted authority like a bank or another financial institution for, to prevent you from spending the same money twice to manage transactions, uh, to, to do a debit where there's a credit or vice versa, uh, and help make sure that digitally assets can only be used once. And we'll come back into what that means a little later. But fundamentally, that's what a blockchain helps you do. And all the other technological details are really just details. <clears throat> and as I said, blockchain is the fundamental technology uh, behind Bitcoin. So let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> what a blockchain is. A blockchain is like a database. The difference in a blockchain from a traditional database is that once a transaction is written, it is unchangeable. And the way that a transaction is unchangeable is by the use of cryptography. And cryptography is the science of storing and using digital codes to encrypt and decrypt data so that their integrity can be maintained. Everybody knows, for example, during World War II, uh, the Germans used the Enigma machine to uh, cryptographically send and receive secret messages. That's what cryptography is. It is the science of codes. Blockchain uses cryptography to ensure that once a transaction is written, it is, it is unchangeable, uh, or at least it takes a lot of work to make that change. So that's an important attribute of a blockchain, because once the truth is down, it is almost impossible to change that truth. In a blockchain, no single entity owns the blockchain. Let me give a contrasting example. When you deal with your bank today, the bank owns the database of the monies that are deposited or withdrawn in the bank. It is centralized, and that provides a certain degree of benefits. It also has some downsides. A blockchain is fundamentally decentralized. No single entity owns a blockchain. Lots of people hold the blockchain, but nobody owns it. The way that people come to conclusion in a blockchain about what transactions are valid and what are not, and what has happened and what has not, is by a consensus mechanism. So only through consensus, through a voting mechanism, do the transactions in a blockchain become uh, valid. And what this means at the end of the day is that not only is there a single source of the truth, but the truth is rather undisputable because you don't have to take the word of a central authority in order to guarantee that that tra transaction is valid. And this notion of being able to have uh, transactions, particularly financial transactions that do not depend on the trustworthiness of a single entity can have some very positive or powerful results that I'm going to talk about in a bit. As I go through here, I just want to be clear that I am not saying that having a central authority is bad. In fact, that's the way our financial system works today, and fundamentally, there are many great benefits that come from it. What I am saying, though, is that the ability to have a decentralized model where there is not a central authority, but there is still trust, is a very powerful concept that we can build some important things on top of that I'm going to uh, explain in a little bit. <clears throat> so what are some uses of <clears throat> blockchains? Well, first of all, cryptocurrencies today are one of the biggest uses of blockchains. Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency. You'll hear about that in the news. You might also hear about Ethereum as another cryptocurrency. Fundamentally, these cryptocurrencies are not the, the system, the network, is not owned or maintained by any single entity. This is very powerful. It means that it is free from some types of government intervention. It means that 
payments can be made across borders uh, without the risk of censorship, because again, there is no central organization. Think about it like the internet. Nobody owns the internet. Everybody is theoretically an equal participant on the internet. In a blockchain, it's a similar notion. It is based on a network of trust that nobody owns wholly, and that allows not only censorship-resistant payments, but censorship-resistant messaging and communications. Think about, for example, um, um, the, the, uh, uh, the Arab Spring when Twitter was used as a communications mechanism. Uh, that actually was a centralized mechanism which made it able to be uh, uh, manipulated by government. That is not really possible in a, in a blockchain case. So censorship resistance, very important. Digital asset management is another very, very uh, important potential use of a blockchain. Think about a minute ago, I said one of the aspects of a blockchain is it prevents this double spend problem. Think about back in the day when music became digital, and it was trivial for you to, for anybody to uh, copy, illegally copy, and give your friend uh, that same song because you could simply copy those bits and give them to somebody else. Blockchain can be used as a technology to ensure, for example, that when I give my bits of a song or some other digital asset to another party, that it is removed from me and that only one person owns it. Think about it in terms of if I'm transferring a deed or a legal contract or some other kind of real-world asset that can only exist in one place and must have clear ownership, a blockchain can be used in that case as well, not only for digital, but for physical assets too. A couple more use cases are uh, uh, supply chain. So a really good example here is Walmart and IBM have teamed up with uh, a number of large name food producers in the industry to track the, the ownership history of produce, for example, bananas. So if uh, a, a lot of bananas, a lot of bananas is found that has um, uh, some sort of contagion, the the ownership history, the supply chain uh, ownership history of those bananas can actually be traced back unambiguously to the source, to a given farm, to a given grower, uh, and this is being used today in in the real world to help cut down on um, problems like that hitting the market and unambiguously identifying the source of those problems. Uh, IBM is another example. Their global finance organization, uh, which has an asset management arm, is using blockchain to ensure the unambiguous transfer of assets from one party to another. The blockchain technology makes the ownership unambiguous without involving uh, outside legal or uh, third-party intermediaries, central intermediaries, um, uh, managing that transaction. New forms of governance and voting as well. One could envision with blockchain technology that digital uh, electronic voting might come to us because one of the fundamental problems with digital voting to solve is that not only do I have one vote and only one vote, but that I am casting my vote as me and not as somebody else. So that's another fundamental way that we could use that technology. So now that I've given some of the technological underpinning of the blockchain, I'm going to switch to Bitcoin itself. And the first thing we're going to do is is define a cryptocurrency. I'm not I like don't like to read slides, but this is one of the only two slides I think in the whole deck I'm going to read on purpose. So a cryptocurrency uh, from Wikipedia, according to Wikipedia, is a digital asset designed to work as a medium of exchange that uses cryptography to secure financial transactions, control the creation of additional units, and verify the transfer of assets. Cryptocurrency is a kind of digital or virtual currency. This definition here, you will notice, has a lot of similarities to my definition of blockchain, and that is because a cryptocurrency, as I said, is built on top of a blockchain. Bitcoin is one cryptocurrency, and it happens to be the biggest by market cap today. And by the way, that market cap is a fraction uh, of what it was a year ago, but still many, many orders of magnitude greater than it was years before that. A little more detail uh, about Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin was formed in 2008 by a pseudonymous uh, gentleman named Satoshi Nakamoto. I say gentleman in the generic sense. Nobody knows exactly if this is a person or a group or a man or a woman. Uh, but Bitcoin was defined in a technology white paper to be a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that would allow payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. And again, this gets back to the blockchain definition, which is that there is not a central authority, and I can have the security of sending and receiving payments without that central financial institution. The intent here was to add payments to the Internet just like fundamental Internet protocols like email or web browsing baked right into the Internet. That was the intention uh, of Bitcoin. And really, the intent also was to create a fundamentally new financial system. What I mean by that is today the electronic mechanisms we have on top of our financial system, banks, money transfers, credit cards, ACH payments, wire transfers, all of those things are essentially electronic mechanisms built on top of our existing legacy financial system. The intent with Bitcoin was to create a new financial system that had nothing to do with the underlying legacy system. And to an extent, I would say that has become the case, and in other ways it has not, which we'll talk to uh, in a little bit. Quick point to clarify, virtual currency and electronic money are not the same thing. When I, let's say, transfer cash electronically through my bank, that is a digital representation of the good old U.S. dollar. Virtual currency, which is Bitcoin, is different. It is fundamentally electronic. There is no physical form to transact with uh, in Bitcoin. So it is, it is a fully 100% virtual currency, not an electronic implementation of good old money. When we use the term Bitcoin, we're really talking about two different things. We're talking Bitcoin the cryptocurrency, which is known by the ticker symbol BTC, and we're also talking about the payment network that is this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network uh, uh, where Bitcoin payments can travel. It's those two things. As we said, it's digital only. Um, you can use Bitcoin in almost any denomination, down to, I think, uh, uh, a millionth of a Bitcoin, if I'm not mistaken. And just like a cent is defined as one one-hundredth of a dollar, one millionth of a Bitcoin is named a Satoshi after the pseudonymous uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Furthermore, uh, one of the interesting attributes of Bitcoin is that it is inherently inflation controlled. And what I mean by that is that the technological underpinnings or the algorithm that is behind Bitcoin limits the total amount of Bitcoin supply that there can ever be. Only 21 million Bitcoin can ever be in existence. And that was somewhat arbitrarily defined, but I think the reason that limit was set was because, as I will explain in a little bit, Bitcoin, new Bitcoin are created over time. Right now, about 19 million Bitcoin exist. The reason 21 million uh, is the cap is it corresponds with a certain time frame in which the creator wanted all the Bitcoin uh, to, be, to be made available. Inflation controlled is as opposed to, let's say, the U.S. dollar, where we or the government can mint new money and deflate the money supply Bitcoin is fundamentally inflation controlled. There can only be a certain uh, amount of it. Uh, we mentioned before that Bitcoin payments, balances, and so on are secured by cryptography, which the biggest impact of is that uh, it's very difficult to go back and modify history. Once something is in stone, it is in stone, and it is inarguable. It's a single source of the truth, and everybody can uh, inspect that. The other attribute of 
Bitcoin, which uh, makes it very interesting. It is known as what's called open source. Open source is a term in the software industry which states to the fact that uh, if software is open source, it means that any software programmer has the ability to look at the ingredients of that source code. And what that does by putting people's eyes on there is gives the ability to uh, look for security holes, to trust that the algorithm is doing what it says, uh, and in general to have peer review. Before I get to the next slide, I want to emphasize again that in none of what I'm saying implies that Bitcoin is good or bad, or, uh, uh, or you should use it or not use it. What I'm trying to do is explain what Bitcoin is and let you make some of those decisions for yourself. Uh, this is a very basic representation of the current financial system and then the financial system with Bitcoin. And very simply, you take out that trusted third party uh, and allowing direct businesses uh, and individuals to transact with one another. A number of interesting side effects here, some of which we talked about before, like censorship resistance, uh, is the ability to potentially have less fees because we don't have an intermediating uh, authority, potentially faster speed, uh, potentially access to greater numbers of people who would be able to maybe not afford the previous financial system. Lots of interesting side effects when you start dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer, um, financial network. So just as we talked about before with the uh, uh, blockchain about some scenarios that can enable, Bitcoin similarly has scenarios that can, can come from it. Uh, democratization of money. Today in the U.S. we have fiat currency. It means that the government fundamentally creates and controls that money supply uh, and, and that it's backed only by the faith and credit of the U.S. government. That's a very powerful concept. Nothing wrong with that. What Bitcoin, though, does is it proposes an alternate model where the community actually controls that money supply instead of central authorities. That would be very appealing to some people who, for example, are against the government creation of money and the uh, 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 deflation that can, or inflation that can come as a result of that. Instant money exchange globally across borders. Uh, anybody who has tried to send money internationally today using the traditional financial system knows the fees, the delays, the lack of standardization that can result. Bitcoin aims to solve a lot of that, but succeeds only in some of that. And we're going to talk a little about that later. But fundamentally, Bitcoin can enable a global money exchange uh, that is equal to all. Um, providing financial services to the unbanked and underbanked. There's regions of the world, for example, where um, there, there is no fundamental banking infrastructure, and Bitcoin has been used peer-to-peer -peer directly between two people's smartphones in order to provide them with money and money transfer services. There's many uh, places in the world where either there are not banks or there are not bank infrastructures, or if somebody, based on their financial situation, is potentially unbanked because of lack of monies, Bitcoin theoretically can provide a solution to that problem, and I'll explain why that's theoretical uh, in, in a few minutes, but it's sort of a powerful notion. Another type of scenario Bitcoin can enable is think of eBay, but without eBay in the middle. Think of an online marketplace where you're able to uh, transact with other people anywhere, anytime, in a trustworthy manner, but without the central authority being there, where the rules are automated. That can be good, that can be bad, it's just an option, and some things are being built today uh, that take advantage of that. Some people have said, is Bitcoin really a currency? And I think it's a great question. It was supposed to be. You saw in the beginning that Satoshi Nakamoto wanted Bitcoin to be a fundamental payment system for the Internet. This has not really happened. 
as it was planned to be. Uh, reasons include the price is incredibly volatile. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But when you look at a currency that is incredibly volatile in its price and subject to massive price swings, it becomes quite unattractive to use in a payment scenario. It is like a currency in the sense that it is a bearer instrument. If you hold the Bitcoin, it is yours. Someone else holds it, it's theirs. Today, in general, uh, it, most people look at Bitcoin as a store of value, what they call a digital gold, as opposed to a currency. However, even as a store of value, it is questionable because Bitcoin is so volatile. People, for example, put money into gold because they believe that it is an enduring, consistent, relatively stable store of value. Bitcoin is certainly not that either. If you look at 10 years ago when Bitcoin came out, it was pennies. It shot up over 2017 to over $20,000 uh, per Bitcoin, and now today is down to about $4,000 of Bitcoin. And in between, it has uh, taken unbelievable swings in between, which make not only the currency aspect of Bitcoin a challenge, but again, also the, the store of value. Uh, also of debate in Bitcoin is, well, how does it, how does it get its value? Uh, stocks, for example, get value because they represent shares of an underlying company which have earnings associated with them. Our currency, U.S. dollar, has value because the government backs it. Commodities have value because they're useful for things. Bitcoin, some people have argued, doesn't have fundamental value because its usefulness is limited. So let's talk about how Bitcoin does get its value today. I think the number one way Bitcoin gets its value is by speculators. People think it's going to go up, so they buy it, hence it gets its value. Uh, this is one of the reasons why you don't hear, in general, smart financial advisors saying to you that they want you to, quote, unquote, invest in Bitcoin because it is primarily driven by speculation as opposed to by fundamentals. That doesn't mean that there aren't people making money in Bitcoin, uh, either through luck or by their own skill, uh, but certainly today speculation is, is the number one use. Utility is another use. It has utility, as we said before, as a potential global peer-to-peer -peer payment mechanism, uh, as, as a way to disintermediate payments and have censorship resistance. Uh, and it does have some um, uh, value uh, as a, a store of, of value itself. Um, the other way that it has utility, I actually read several examples. Um, look, at, look at certain countries where uh, Russia, as an example, I read several news stories uh, where several very, very wealthy people wanted to move money out of Russia. But if they did that in a standard money exchange where rubles were moved into, let's say, U.S. dollars, that would completely be subject to government intervention, whereas if they went into Bitcoin, moved the money, and then out of Bitcoin again, it would potentially be uh, a loop around those, those restrictions. And then finally, scarcity. Things that are fundamentally scarce have more value. As I said, 21 million Bitcoin maximum, and this slide is a little bit old today. There's about 19 million Bitcoin uh, in circulation. I want to make one interesting point. That is that supposedly, according to some metrics, 6 million Bitcoin today are supposedly not accessible at all. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment, but people have forgotten their passwords. They've lost their keys. And so almost fully a third of the Bitcoin today may not ever be available for circulation, which further limits the supply. That's what happens when you have uh, a technology that comes out of nowhere, gets explosive growth, and you have people in the beginning who bought many, many Bitcoins for pennies, and then later on are kicking themselves because they lost millions of dollars in, uh, in potential value. It's just an interesting point. So uh, as a summary, as we said before, as a store of value, uh, it's challenging because it's highly volatile. 
uh, as a currency. Bitcoin today is accepted in some places, although still not widely so. Uh, and as an investment, uh, certainly it is speculation that drives, that drives most of that. But as I said, most people agree that of all else, speculation is Bitcoin's uh, greatest use today. Let's talk about some, some technical details here. Who controls your funds? Well, when it comes to the traditional banking system, the bank holds your monies, and you trust the bank to do so. In general, that works out, and that works out because we have, in general, a healthy financial system. We have the FDIC insurance uh, uh, today, which insures bank deposits up to $250,000 per individual. If I'm not mistaken, through U.S. history, even though there's been runs on banks, uh, the FDIC has never failed to make anybody whole. This hasn't been the case in, in every country. If you look at Greece, for example, it was unthought of that it could happen. But in Greece, several years ago, people's bank savings were actually seized uh, by the government when the Greek financial crisis happened. So it is possible that your monies are not safe uh, in a bank. In Bitcoin, it is fundamentally you that hold on to your Bitcoin. Actually, more specifically, you hold on to what are called keys, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's a big difference here in trust. In Bitcoin, it's you, and in the banks, it's the banks. It's a, it's a very big distinction. Um, and actually is one of the reasons, I think, why Bitcoin adoption is not broad is because the technological requirement and requirement of tech savviness to hold on to Bitcoin is, I think, higher than most people want to deal with, uh, which, is, which is one of the reasons, I think, why adoption is slow. In either case, it's, it's all digital. In the bank, it's just a digital representation of your money. Um, how and where are, are Bitcoins stored? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Because Bitcoin is, requires a level of tech savvy to manage on your own, Bitcoin exchanges have popped up. One of the most popular is called Coinbase. If you look at Coinbase.com, you'll see that it is an exchange not unlike uh, a brokerage that provides liquidity to the Bitcoin market. So you can take U.S. dollars, you can buy Bitcoin, and you can take Bitcoin and sell them and convert them into U.S. dollars. So not only do those exchanges marry buyers and sellers like any brokerage whose, whose job it is to uh, maintain liquidity, but they also remove some of the technological requirements on the user by storing your Bitcoin or storing your Bitcoin keys for you. Um, that's a bit of a double-edged sword. Some in the Bitcoin community argue that the only way to hold on to your Bitcoin is for you to do it yourself and not to trust someone else because, as we're going to see in a couple slides, uh, if you lose the keys to your Bitcoin, you're stuck. That's it. There's no central authority to complain to. So exchanges kind of provide a hybrid there. There's also Bitcoin wallets. Bitcoin wallets are generally software that runs on your, uh, uh, either on your browser or on your PC and allows you to store Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies um, um, securely. There's also, you can look at the bottom right of the slide, uh, there's hardware solutions that allow you to store your Bitcoin keys securely as well. But all of these are, are different wallet types. Again, software, there's desktop, there's mobile, there's web wallets, and, and there's hardware wallets uh, that gives you differing degrees of, uh, of security. Um, Reemphasizing a point that I said before, uh, you hold on to keys, not coins. This is a big, a big distinction. When you hold cash in your hand, you're holding the cash. When you hold Bitcoin, what you're actually doing is holding keys that unlock the Bitcoin on the network or unlock the Bitcoin on the blockchain. If you recall before when I said that up to 6 million 
Bitcoin may be lost, that's because those keys are lost. And when those keys are lost, because of the strength of the cryptography involved, it's basically impossible with today's computers to recover those funds. So if you are ever interested in playing with Bitcoin, make sure you have a strategy for protecting your keys. And there's, that's out of the scope of this uh, webinar, but there's tons of resources online that, that help give you those protections. Again, keys grant access to the Bitcoins. The coins themselves live on the Bitcoin blockchain. You just hold the keys. And reemphasizing what I just said, once you lose them, you're stuck. And the reason is there is no central authority. Um, buying and selling Bitcoin, how do you do that? Well, generally, it's through an exchange. Um, exchanges provide liquidity to the market. They provide you just like in a stock exchange. People are willing to uh, uh, spend a certain money to buy Bitcoin. People are willing to sell Bitcoin at a certain amount of money. The exchanges uh, uh, help marry those buyers and sellers together. Certainly, you can find a private partner, and there are websites that let you find individuals and meet on the corner of Maine and Maine and exchange Bitcoins, but that's pretty rare for, for obvious reasons. So exchanges like uh, Coindesk, Gemini, Robinhood, Kraken, these are all um, well-known exchanges that can provide uh, liquidity. Also, some of the Bitcoin wallets, for example, that you may have on your smartphone uh, allow you to directly buy and sell Bitcoin as well. What about sending and receiving Bitcoin between multiple people or maybe between multiple accounts? Well, the way it works is that all uh, Bitcoin wallets have addresses, and addresses are sort of read-only. So I can give you my Bitcoin address, and the way the technology works is you can send me Bitcoin if you want, but you can't take my Bitcoin. So addresses by, by default are public. Uh, you have to know your receiver's address. If you have an account on Coinbase and a friend of yours has an account on Coinbase and you want to send and receive funds, Coinbase makes it very easy by telling your friend your address. This is the same way that merchants, if they want to take payments via Bitcoin, some of them on their website show a big Bitcoin address, which is a really big, ugly-looking uh, string of numbers and digits. Uh, that is the public address that allows you to, to send money. Um, to somebody else. Something to think about when you're sending money to somebody, because again, there's no central authority. If you send money in Bitcoin to the wrong address, uh, you are stuck unless that person agrees to give it back. So there, there are complexities here that need to be solved um, before greater adoption can happen. From a regulatory point of view, uh, the IRS treats cryptocurrency as property. So if you, for example, have Bitcoin on an exchange and you meet a certain, I forgot what the limit is, I think it's $10,000 of transactions uh, or gain within some period of time, uh, you, they'll produce you a 1099. You then have to uh, uh, pay short or long-term capital gains on that, just like it was any other type of, uh, of property. Uh, the SEC has so far said that um, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are not a security. There is a test called the Howey test, I believe it's H-O-W-E-Y, that the SEC uses to determine whether or not a given financial instrument is a security. And uh, the fact that they have found it not a security is good news to the cryptocurrency community because it means slightly less regulation, but depending on how you look at it, that regulation in terms of consumer protections may be good or may be bad. I also want to comment that the uh, cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase are all regulated by the government and by the states as what they call money services business, MSB. So they have to undergo a rigorous compliance process, a rigorous reporting process. They have to adhere to what are known as uh, anti-money laundering or AML laws, which means they also have to uh, 
uh, observe know your customer laws KYC they have to you have to prove who you are you probably have to show what your social is you have to prove uh, uh, your address and the reasons that is for uh, are to prevent you know the uh, handling of illegal activity so these these um, entities are regulated as entries and exits from the Bitcoin financial system um, it's not a free ride. As I said before, uh, there are concerns that make Bitcoin today not necessarily what it was supposed to be. A lot of speculation, a lot of volatility. Uh, acceptance is, is not wide, uh, and many people are concerned by the fact that uh, it has, it's not backed by anything. But in a few minutes, I'm actually going to talk about why these concerns may not be a big deal. Uh, but continuing on, uh, uh, fees and transactions with Bitcoin, uh, transaction speed can vary. That's a problem. Uh, it is often too technical to use. There is a perception, although I think it's wrong, that because Bitcoin provides a level of anonymity that it breeds illegal use, actually cash is much more anonymous than Bitcoin. Bitcoin, there are ways to trace. You're only pseudo-anonymous in Bitcoin, um, which means that you're identified as a number as opposed to an individual. Cash is actually far more anonymous than Bitcoin, um, as is an interesting point. There's also regulatory inconsistencies while in the U.S. For example, the IRS treats Bitcoin as, uh, as property. It may not be the same all over the world. So here's really the, the meat and potatoes of, of what I hope you come out with um, today. Bitcoin is important for a number of reasons beyond its price. It's kind of forging us and the government and society to think of a new financial system. Bitcoin may not be the future of digital currency, but certainly I think there will be a digital currency in the future, and Bitcoin is kind of paving the road for that and setting the rules for that. So in that sense, it's really a big experiment, a big proof of concept that everybody, including the states, the people, the government agencies, are trying to figure out a way around. So think of it as kind of like the first ship to the new world. It's helping to, to drive innovation and, and social thinking and financial thinking in a way that is necessary at some point. But Bitcoin itself may or may not be um, the answer. So it's all of those things. Uh, and only time will tell. And again, whether Bitcoin itself turns out to be the one is probably not that, not that critical. It's what it's forcing, the thinking that it's forcing, that's the most important. There's other cryptocurrencies. Uh, each does a unique thing. Ethereum is the second business, biggest cryptocurrency by market cap. The point of Ethereum is to put contracts, actually legal contracts, in software instead of in lawyers. That has some interesting side effects if you think about that. Um, uh, JP Morgan, for example, does a lot of innovation around this cryptocurrency called Ripple, which is specifically designed for fast transactions. There's also cryptocurrencies that are specifically designed for privacy. So all kinds of use cases. As we wrap up here, I'm going to go five or six more minutes, talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin itself under the hood. This is kind of picking up on five minutes on, on uh, what we said before about blockchain. So Bitcoin, again, not owned by anybody. It sits on about 10,000 machines um, around the world. These machines are owned by people and enthusiasts and businesses and nobody in particular. Everybody's sort of an equal participant. Um, and as I said, just like with blockchain, it's consensus based. It's voting that makes the network trustworthy. We talked ad nauseum about fraud resistance, so I won't go back into that again. Think of Bitcoin network like your standard accounting ledger, except that now the accounting ledger, a copy of it, is held on 10,000 different machines with everybody being able to see everybody's transactions and everybody being able to verify the integrity of all those transactions. So it is a completely what I call democratic and transparent way of, of managing that currency. Uh, in Bitcoin, and this part is a bit out of scope, but I'll touch on it briefly. As I said, there's a voting system. Uh, the people who vote are 
provided with an incentive and a reward system for processing Bitcoin transactions. This is what's called mining, and the reward for processing Bitcoin transactions is that the miner is granted more Bitcoin. So there's an incentive for people to provide their computing power to run the cryptography that's necessary to validate the transactions, to secure the network, and ultimately that Bitcoin is created as, as a reward for mining. Uh, in summary here, Bitcoin is, is one of many uh, cryptocurrencies. Whether it itself is the future of cryptocurrency is far less important than the lessons that uh, we're hearing today, than, sorry, they, than the specific uh, implementation. And the impact of Bitcoin, I would argue, is greater than what you hear in the news, especially the mass media, only because the mass media tends to focus on the price jumps. If you're interested in more of the fundamentals of Bitcoin, uh, there's a couple of really good newsletters. One is from uh, Coindesk that you can look at. They publish a daily newsletter that, in my opinion, gives a relatively objective view um, of the cryptocurrency market. Uh, that wraps it up. I've got my email here in case anybody has questions, and I guess we're going to take questions now, Steve, in the last few minutes. Yeah, Matt, hey, listen, thanks very much. Uh, excellent job of covering a very complicated uh, subject. I don't know if it's actually as complicated as it's just completely new paradigm kind of thinking, for at least for me. I found it very interesting. Um, yeah, we have a lot of questions, and I want to kind of net them out here. But one of them that is actually kind of struck me is, is that, you know, there's a lot of anonymity around uh, this whole Bitcoin world and its very secure payment process. For example, ransomware is regularly paid in Bitcoin. Well, can you speak to why that is, why why ransomware, or why it's, well, basically, I guess, is why is there so much anonymity around such a secure payment process? So the, the, reason, the, the reason why I think Bitcoin is used for payment in ransomware attacks, it, it is because when the attacker balances out the anonymity associated with keeping themselves secure versus the likelihood that they will actually be able to, to uh, collect that ransom, Bitcoin is actually a good middle ground. It's anonymous enough that it generally allows the bad guy to be untraceable. Certainly, if you said PayPal them, it would not be a good thing because PayPal is regulated to hell. Uh, and, and it has a central authority. So I think it's that balance that provides that. By the way, just one comment. Uh, the, by far the bigger problem with ransomware it, it, beyond Bitcoin is that you should have backups to protect yourself. Forget the Bitcoin aspect of it. It's getting yourself out of that situation without making the payment. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, so let me just say, like, who, who – so the question was a little more specific than the one I'm going to ask you, but, like, who are the primary users of Bitcoin at this point in time? You know, you said there's 21 million Bitcoins out, 6 million are on the sidelines maybe forever. Somebody's using them. I'm not. I don't know whether you are. Who, who typically is using them? I think, I think the primary users of Bitcoin today – are the speculators. I think that uh, they're, they're the people trying to time the market. They're trying to make money off, off the growth of Bitcoin, um, I would say, is the primary, primary market. I would say the secondary use of Bitcoin, which is by far less use, is actually in transacting Bitcoin payments. Uh, and then the third use probably is, you know, the average uh, citizen who's interested in playing with the tech and maybe trying to make a little money, uh, doing, doing a little bit of gambling, doing a little bit of guessing, whatever they call it. Uh, but again, I think that those things are not necessarily fortunate, but even being true, it still helps kind of forge the new rules of what a fundamentally new financial system could be like. Yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good point. Hey, uh, Jim uh, Wachowski has asked two questions, and both of them are, are good. Um, first one he asked was, th "This is actually about blockchain more than uh, more than Bitcoin." So get your brain over into blockchain mode here. Is blockchain useful for creating an ebook and wanting to distribute to others for a price without the purchaser being able to copy and redistribute? 
Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely it is. And it's interesting you say that because there are services today. I don't know if they do that specifically for ebooks, but there are services that do that for for digital assets in general, different kinds of media, maybe songs, maybe maybe other assets. I'm sure ebooks are, uh, or or I should say, digitally restricted media or media where you want to maintain digital rights is an absolute use. I wish I had some resources on top of mind, but if you Google uh, uh, blockchain services for managing digital assets, you're bound to find mention of ebook. In fact, there's a lot of work going on today, uh, I think, which will turn out to be year, very useful, not only to have blockchain track digital assets, but to actually track physical assets and their ownership. For example, whether it's art, when you go to, everybody knows, Steve, when you go to Christie's and buy a $2 million painting, which I'm sure you do all the time, you want to know the origin of that painting, who owned it, what the provenance was. There's lots of innovation going on there, too. Um, so the answer is yes, Jim. Another one from Jim. Uh, do any retailers use Bitcoin, for example, our friends at Amazon? You know, I don't know if Amazon does. I know Subway did at one point. I don't remember. Uh, I, that's, you know, that's a question. I should have had that in the presentation. I, I, I don't keep track of who does it today. But, again, if you Google who takes Bitcoin, you'll probably come up with a, with a handful of, uh, of shops. Although, again, I think shops maybe – if they take Bitcoin today, they're doing it because they want to be tech forward. But it's really not, in my opinion, a terrific way of paying. You're not going to feel good if you pay for your sandwich with a, with a fraction of a Bitcoin, and the next day that Bitcoin is worth five times as much. You're going to say, oh, shucks. So that's a problem today. Um, okay, so just move, moving on here with CSL. I'm up above. David Lee, is there any difference between altcoins and digital tokens? Do they share the same properties. You got that? Right. right. So an, so an altcoin, the definition of an altcoin is it's just an alternate coin. It, it simply means a cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin. So Ethereum, Ripple, those are all altcoins. A digital token, this is a this is a really interesting point. You'll sometimes hear the term digital token refer to a unit of cryptocurrency. What a digital token really is, is an electronic representation of a physical thing. So let's go back to my blockchain example. Let's say that I go back to IBM and, uh, uh, and their blockchain for tracking produce. They will have a token on that blockchain, which is a digital representation of that batch of bananas. And... That token is what is tracked electronically through the system. Think of a token as just like a movie ticket or uh, uh, a chit or something that stands for a physical thing. It is simply an electronic representation of a physical thing. So it's not necessarily that there's a difference between altcoins and tokens. It's that some altcoins are tokens and some altcoins are not tokens is the best way I think I can answer that. All right, good, good couple more here. We've got uh, a couple five minutes left. Um, so, uh, by the way, there's a note here. This is interesting. Hmm. There's a, it's just an F FYI from uh, Linda McGovern. She said there's a Norwich Cybersecurity Summit in Norwich, obviously, June 18th and 19th. It's like, some people might be interested in, uh, in joining that. Um, so Chris Kelly says, does each coin like – this is way beyond me, man. I hope you got this. Does each coin like TRX and ADA have their own blockchain, or do they run on either BTC or ETH? So that, that's a really interesting question. It gets to the technical heart of things. I can answer it this way. Um, Bitcoin, BTC, runs on its own blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain technology is only for running Bitcoin. Ethereum – on the other hand, is actually the home for many other coins. I don't remember whether TRX or ADA run on top of Ethereum, but the way Ethereum was built is not only does it support its own cryptocurrency called an Ether, or Ethereum, uh, one unit of which is called an Ether, but the Ethereum technology is actually what many other 
coins or tokens ride on top of. So not in every case does each coin have its own blockchain. In many, many cases, most of the new coins coming out today, but not all, run on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, Chris, I hope that uh, answered your question. If not, you could quickly post another one. We've got one more, two more questions here. Um, it's from Laura Ferrara. Is all that inaccessible money, because of the lost keys, a sort of finders, keepers, buried treasure for someone who can figure out the key? Uh, I would say in general, yes, that's the case. If you lost your keys and someone found those keys, either by digging through your garbage or by having enough computer resources to somehow break those keys, which today is considered computationally infeasible, then yes, uh, it, the monies are uh, up to grabs for those people. It's generally, under today's computing resources, considered impossible to do that. Uh, I would say there's probably not a lot you can do once keys are lost, although I guess there are exceptions. Uh, I think there was a cryptocurrency exchange several months ago that went out of business because the, uh, the person who ran it died. The keys for that cryptocurrency, for those exchanges, were actually kept on this person's laptop, which was encrypted. Eventually, the story ended well, but that's sort of, I think, not usual. Once those keys are gone, it's pretty impossible to get them. All right, let's, let's cut it there. I think, uh, Keenan, I, I think uh, Matt answered your question uh, before when uh, he talked about what they're, what they're used for. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and cut it down now. It's one minute to the hour. And I want to thank Matt for a really great job. He got some good comments here about how professional it was, and, 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 and I would ex go along with that 100%. Thank you very much. And um, just a reminder, a uh, couple things. A, this is going to be available, this webinar, the audio and the slides, by the end of the day at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Click on on-demand webinars. Uh, we have two webinars each month, and as I said before, the next one is the 16th. That's two weeks from day, same time, same bat time, same bat channel. You can get an idea as to how old I am by my having said that. The name of that, uh, the uh, title of that is Lean Business Canvas, and that, again, is kind of like a viability test of your business idea is the best way I would describe that. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to, when you go to our website, uh, you know, consider signing up for individual counseling. Uh, as I said, almost 20% of the people who attend webinars do that, and just uh, click on Request a Mentor. So on behalf of SCORE, really thanks to all for attending. A big, big thanks to Matt Krieger for presenting a uh, complicated, but now, for me anyway, much simpler um, topic. Again, Matt will be at the uh, Darien Library next Tuesday from 6 to 8. Have a nice day, everybody, and welcome to spring. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.